Hello, I'm Matt Flennis with the Southwest Initiative for the Study of Middle East Conflicts, and welcome to SISMEC Presents, a discussion on the most current issues of conflict throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Today we're joined by David Dunford, adjunct instructor in the departments of Near Eastern Studies and the School of Government and Public Policy. Mr. Dunford was Deputy U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 1988 to 1992 and Ambassador to Oman from 1992 to 1995. He worked with the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq during the spring of 2003 as a senior advisor to Iraq's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And more germane to this conversation, David has almost a decade of diplomatic experience in Egypt. Welcome, David. Great to have you. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, as you uh, said to me in an aside um, this past week, when you first arrived as the Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs in Egypt in 1991, the Hosni Mubarak government was so new that when you first met Mubarak himself, he still had a bandage on his finger from the violence of the assassination during, uh, or of the uh, previous president in War Sadat, is that correct? That's right, it was 1981. 1981, excuse me. Uh, when 81. I arrived. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I got to meet Sadat once, I think, before he was assassinated. Mubarak was, of course, sitting next to Sadat mm -hmm. when Sadat was uh, uh, gunned down. By and his Mubarak, own people, right? His own security by his, guards. Yeah, by people in a military parade. Mm. So they were technically part of the military, hmm. uh, but also Islamist. Okay. With any connections to the, the Muslim Brotherhood at all that, that we know well, of? Or? That opens up a whole new subject. For the most part, mm -hmm. the Muslim Brotherhood is um, a pretty tame uh, political party that uh, you know wants to participate and not dominate the political process. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt, of course, is famous for some uh, people like Zawahiri and yeah. Syed Qutb who very much have uh, helped Osama bin Laden, but, mm -hmm. but for the most part, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is relatively tame, in mm -hmm. my view. Yeah, well, and there, I have some questions about the, the Brotherhood that we'll get to a little bit later, but I was just kind of wondering um, how Mubarak seemed to you when you uh, first met him with that bandaged finger way back in 1981. Yeah, the bandage was on his thumb. Thumb, and, okay. Uh, you know, he seemed seemed a little surprised, uh -huh. not not quite like a deer in the headlights, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he expected to become president so soon. Mm -hmm. uh, he was seen, I think, by the United States as, um, you know, uh, an, part of an orderly transition, uh, maintaining uh, Egypt's foreign policy toward Israel. Mm -hmm. um, we hoped he would be more interested in economic reform, I think, than Anwar Sadat was. Mm -hmm. uh, Mubarak was certainly not as uh, flamboyant Mm -hmm. uh, as Sadat or um, in his lifestyle or he may have become so in his later years. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now this is a bit of a kind of a hypothetical and the question that um, everyone's asking but with the protests now entering their second week um, tomorrow I believe uh, do you see any sign of an end game and how do you think this would play out? Um, I guess anyone who tells you they know how it's going to play out, you should look at with great suspicion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very fluid, very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've seen, I think, is the, the regime, um, partly out of desperation, but partly out of, out of a skill playing good cop, bad cop. You're seeing some winners and losers, but remember Mubarak is still standing. Mm -hmm. The military is still standing. I think the uh, Ministry of Interior, the uh, Mubahith or secret police, uh, mm -hmm. I think their stock is way down. Okay. Uh, perhaps Gamal Mubarak and uh, who's oh, his son. seen by many, Gamal yeah. Mubarak is seen by many as sort of the, the link of the regime to crony capitalists, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I think their stock is way down. But um, remember, it is a, a military regime. Mm -hmm. And the military uh, has uh, set itself up as the protector of the people in the square. Mm -hmm. uh, they did, of course, let the uh, the thugs with the camels and horses in for a, yep. a mm -hmm. day of violence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then presumably the military could have prevented that. Mm -hmm. Prevented that, but uh, I think the people are still looking to the military as uh, on their side. Okay. I think what will Part of what will determine how this plays out is uh, how much pressure the Egyptian people can handle economically. I think there are a lot of Egyptians who are eager for some resolution so they can go back to work and uh, put food on the table and things like that. Yeah, that actually uh, gets to my next question. Since you know you have so much experience with economics and economic reconstruction, I was wondering 
in your mind, how bad you saw or how badly um, the Egyptian economy had been damaged with this? I know a lot of people were saying that it's basically, you know, come to a halt over the past two weeks. Um, and what do you think the reconstruction will look like? Um, mm -hmm. Can, for example, the tour tourism industry bounce back? Yeah, let's start with there. There, are basically five pillars of Egyptian economy. Uh, tourism is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. The Suez Canal and the revenues mm -hmm. it provides. Oil, gas, uh, not a huge part of the economy, but big enough to be important. Mm -hmm. And then remittances from Egyptians who work uh, overseas, mainly in the Arabian Peninsula, places like that. And then finally, foreign investment. Yeah, foreign investment uh, plays a big plays a big role, an increasingly large role in the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, what's happening now? This tourism season is essentially over for the Egyptians, mm -hmm. uh, like 1997 when there was a attack on tourists in oh, Luxor, yeah. mm -hmm. like 9-11 um, uh, or the, the year of 9-11 that pretty yeah. much shut down tourism. The early Egypt. 2000s to the attacks in They uh, bounced Sharm back okay. uh, in each case and, mm -hmm. and presumably will bounce back again as long as the, the antiquities aren't destroyed or the, the mm -hmm. tourism sites. Um, foreign investment or just, in fact, money held by Egyptians, my guess, has been fleeing uh, at a pretty good rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Egyptian pound is probably under a lot of pressure. Um, and uh, with each passing day that this crisis remains unresolved, I think uh, it's going to be harder and harder for the economy to bounce back. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this phenomenon in today's world where investors move money at the click of a mouse, and, yeah. and a lot of money is flown right out of Egypt. And then, yeah. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, now, just the other day, we saw uh, that a uh, gas, I think it was a gas line, and the Suez had been, um, uh, there was a, some mal a malfunction, and there was a fire, and some of the, the gas uh, going into Jordan and uh, Israel mm -hmm. had been shut off. Now, I think I've heard that Israel gets about half of its natural gas from Egypt, um, so it has a lot at stake in, in what's going on. Um, and that kind of gets into my next question, which is, we seem to see two competing factors here between the domestic issues and concerns of unemployment and food prices and whatnot, as well as the more regional and strategic interests of the peace with Israel, U.S. interests. Um, they seem to kind of be maybe not colliding, but uh, a bit problematic at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and this might be a little overly simplified, but which, which do you think might win out? Do you think um, that the regional and strategic interests will be able to somewhat placate the um, the popular support for real change, or can they coexist? Um, how do you see those two factors uh, working out? Well, I, I think the domestic factors are going to dominate, certainly over the coming months. Uh, every, every Egyptian, every Egyptian who has influence is waking up each morning trying to decide uh, what's, what's in his interest as well as mm -hmm. what's in Egypt's interest, his or her interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you watch that play out, uh, I think concerns about international, about foreign policy, and concerns even about uh, things like capital flight and foreign investment uh, will take a back seat. Mm -hmm. But over time, of course, those those concerns will will constrict uh, the choices that people can make. And, mm -hmm. and so you got a short term, long term issue there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, the U.S. recently said that it was reviewing its aid package to Egypt, which is the second largest uh, in the world behind Israel at about $2 billion per year. Um, and as you probably know, the vast majority of it goes towards uh, military expenses. Now, in light of the current protests, uh, many of, uh, much of which people have said are based upon uh, a lot of economic issues, do you think uh, it would have made more sense to focus on economic aid instead of military? And um, while you were there, I guess this is the second question, uh, how much pressure did the uh, Department of State put on the Mubarak regime to uh, reform economically? Ooh, you asked some complicated questions. I'll have to <laughs> see if we can sort them out. Remind me if I'm yeah, missing some okay. of it. Um, okay, foreign assistance. Uh, we provide, as best I can determine, about a billion and a half. Billion now, and a half. it okay. used to be over, well over two billion. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the military assistance has remained very steady at 1.3 billion. Okay. This goes back to uh, when Henry Kissinger was doing shuttle diplomacy between Egypt and Israel and determined that uh, foreign assistance to both uh, e economic and military was an important element of the settlement. Mm -hmm. And it was in perhaps the late 90s when Benjamin Netanyahu was Prime Minister of Israel the first time. Mm -hmm 
that Netanyahu decided uh, that Israel didn't need all that economic assistance. And the Congress of the United States of America decided that if Israel didn't need all that economic assistance, uh, we're going to scale back Egypt's economic assistance. Okay. So it's not, not really uh, the State Department's call I see. Uh, or even the White House's call on um, how much economic assistance they get. Uh, leverage over Egypt, we had some leverage with our large assistance program. When I was there, we had $815 million, um, through AID and also some uh, PL 480, which is uh, direct food aid. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had some leverage, and we used that as best we could. But the political the political factors also uh, held a lot of uh, influence. Uh, mm -hmm. Egypt maintaining its peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. So the Mubarak uh, government made some moves. They were they were not as large as we would have wanted in the direction of economic reform, but they made some. And in fact, in 1987, I believe, Egypt made enough moves that the IMF and the World Bank were able to uh, sign them up for uh, uh, structural package. assistance yeah. in the case of the World mm -hmm. Bank and uh, mm -hmm. you know, balance of payments uh, assistance in the case of the IMF. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of gets into another question that I had, which was, do you see the protests as more of a response to economic conditions than political, or is it a, a kind of an ambiguous mix between the two? I mean, what do you see as the, the real issues that are driving people to come out mm -hmm. in tens of thousands into the streets of Tahrir Square, for Well, the, the economic situation has been there uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got to Egypt, they had 41 mil million people. Now they have 83 million, I believe. And they all live in about 4% of the land along the Nile River and in the Nile Delta. Uh, Egypt, under Nasser, pretty much adopted a, what I would call a Soviet model economy. Uh, Egyptians would object to that moniker, I'm sure, but essentially it was central planned with lots and lots of state-owned industries. And, uh, Egypt still hasn't unwound itself, despite all the um, encouraging of private investment, despite some privatization here and there. Um, Egypt still has this kind of state-owned industry economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has led, I think, to uh, a fairly stagnant economy much of the time. Uh, over recent years, foreign investment has, has helped move it along quicker. They've reformed their currency so it, it floats on the international market. So they've, they've done some good things and, and brought some dynamism into the economy, but it still has that weight of a state-owned model. Mm -hmm. Now, that's been there for ever since uh, Egypt made peace with Israel, okay. or before. Um, the political side of this, this uh, issue is that increasingly uh, Egyptian elections have become a sham. Uh, they were never fully democratic. Uh, the parliament, the Majlis al-Shab, the People's Assembly, mm -hmm. uh, was always pretty much under control of the president, but Egypt, Egyptians are political people, there was a political life, there was, there was the opportunity uh, to win elections at local levels. But the last elections for uh, the People's Assembly were just uh, clearly fraudulent. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the combination of continuing uh, economic issues, the, the fact that there are so many young people who, when they, who are educated, but don't see a, a future, don't see the ability to get the kind of job they need to move out of their parents' home mm -hmm. and get married, things like that. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of frustration mm -hmm. uh, building up. And uh, the government's heavy hand, the, the clear fraudulent elections, the, the suppression of media freedom, things like that mm -hmm. have all sort of added up. 